Well, hello there, friends, and welcome back. My name is Stephanie Safarian, and you're listening to episode 381 of Sustainable Minimalists, a show about intentional and eco-friendly minimalist living. We are on to part two of Climate Optimism Week, and today we're discussing carbon capture technologies. The world has a big fat carbon problem, does it not? There's too much of it in the atmosphere, and our lifestyles paired with the polluting business practices of companies and corporations, all of that together is pumping even more carbon into the atmosphere as we speak. So enter carbon capturing, which is one of many solutions, in my opinion, that need to happen at the same time if we want to curb the deadliest effects of climate change. And so I say it needs to be one of many solutions because, yes, we are going to have to stop burning carbon-emitting fossil fuels. And yes, we are going to have to switch to clean energy like wind and solar. But the carbon that's already in the atmosphere, is there anything we can do about it? Well, the answer is yes. And on today's show, I have five different examples of what could be done or what is currently being done to help remove some of that excess carbon. Now, I have a big goal for today's show, and it is this. After listening, I want you to feel big and bold and confident in all your new knowledge so that you can tell everybody in your lives all about carbon capturing, so that you can now be an expert on carbon capture technologies. That's my goal. You'll have to write to me at the end of the show and tell me if I succeed it. So let's start out with carbon capturing. What is it exactly? <laughs> it's a really an umbrella term for technologies. And some carbon capture ideas have been around since the 1980s, so 30, 40-ish years almost. Carbon capture technologies aim to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere or, and here's the big or, catch the carbon and store it somehow in something or underground before it's released into the air. Now, carbon capture is not yet being done on the large scale. It is, however, being pushed by companies and politicians as the main proponent of a carbon neutral future. And so there's a bunch of carbon capture technologies I want to talk about today, but we can't talk about the more sophisticated ones until we talk about the best and most natural and most proven method of carbon capturing first. And that, of course, is, take a guess, yeah, it's trees. (laughs) Trees are nature's OG carbon capturers, aren't they not? Let's go back to biology class for a hot minute and discuss photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is that process when plants and trees use sunlight and water and, yes, carbon dioxide to create oxygen and energy. It's brilliant, isn't it? It almost makes you wonder whether there's a larger and smarter force, creator, dare I say, behind it all, doesn't it? So what's the problem? Trees are the OG carbon capturer. Why not just plant more trees? Well, There are communities and organizations and locations throughout the world that are solely focused on reforestation. The problem, however, is that natural ecosystems like forests, yes, but also other natural ecosystems like wetlands, let's say, that do indeed absorb carbon from the air cannot capture carbon at a fast enough rate. So I'm going to say that in a better, smarter way. We human beings are still burning fossil fuels at an absolutely ridiculous rate. So the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is rising faster than these OG carbon capturers can capture the carbon. Trees and other natural ecosystems have not been able to counteract the sheer amount of carbon that our collective lifestyle is putting into the atmosphere. Okay, so that's trees. Trees want to capture carbon, but we're thwarting them by number one, cutting down large swaths of greenery, and by number two, putting more carbon into the air than the trees that we do have can realistically remove. So that's one. Another way to capture carbon is with small-scale solutions. 
Now, there are many small-scale carbon solutions happening right now all around the globe. In a recent headlines episode, for example, I did mention how some breweries, beer breweries, right, they're capturing the carbon that's released during the fermentation process, and then they're later reusing that carbon to create the foam in their beer. That's an example of a small-scale carbon capture solution. There's another one I want to cover too, and it's an apartment building in New York City. So I'm taking you right now to an apartment building in Manhattan's Upper West Side. It's a 30-story apartment building called Grand Tier, and they are effectively running a small-scale carbon capture operation as we speak. So the building is still burning natural gas for heat. Nothing new there. But the hot exhaust from the boilers gets funneled through ducts to basically this big room filled with compressors and metal tanks. And inside those tanks, they filter out the carbon dioxide from other gases And then the remaining carbon dioxide is chilled to negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit and turned into liquid carbon. And every week or so, a little tanker truck pulls up to this apartment building. Workers connect a hose to the side of the building. The hose sucks out all this liquid carbon. And then the liquid carbon is transported to a cement factory, essentially. They take the liquid carbon, they dump it into giant mixers along with some cement and some sand and some other stuff, and they're creating concrete blocks. So then the concrete blocks will be used to make buildings, etc. And if you're wondering, well, what happens if the cement blocks are crushed? Does the carbon just emit into the air? The answer is no. Even if the blocks are later destroyed, the carbon cannot escape. It's a circular economy of sorts with regard to carbon. So those are just two examples of small-scale solutions. But if you keep your ear to the ground, especially in your community even, you may learn about one or two more. They're out there. They're happening, but they're on the small scale, so they don't get as much attention. Now we're going to move on to the two carbon capture techniques that are happening on the large scale and are getting the lion's share of attention. The first is post-combustion capture, and this is what I really want you to know and understand, so we are going to go ahead and take our quick break, and when we come back, we'll discuss post-combustion capture, we'll talk about direct air capture, we'll talk about putting CO2 to use and sequestration and all that after a quick sponsor break. With the prices of produce at the supermarket skyrocketing, Home gardening is not only a fun hobby, but it's also a great way to save money on groceries. TrueLeafMarket.com is a supplier of exclusively non-GMO seeds. They have a huge selection, vegetables, herbs, microgreens, flowers, I could go on and on. And the best part is their seed packets are among the most affordable you'll find online. Now, I'm a bit late to the gardening game this year. And so I was super excited when the seeds I bought from True Leaf Market shipped the same day I ordered them. I bought my daughters a microgreens growing kit and oh my gosh, they are so in love. Visit trueleafmarket.com and enter promo code MINMOMS10 for $10 off any order of $50 or more. That's trueleafmarket.com with promo code M-I-N-M-O-M-S 10. If you consider yourself a sustainable minimalist, you already know that what you eat matters. That's why I'm proud to partner with Green Chef, the only certified organic meal kit company. Now, I'll admit, I was skeptical. I'm not a fan of the waste in most of these meal kits, but I was happy to learn that Green Chef is the only meal kit that offsets 100% of its carbon footprint and 100% of the plastic in every box. There is some plastic inside for food safety reasons, but the box insulation is plant-based and lots of what's inside is also made from 100% post-consumer waste. Now, if you're wondering how the food tastes, that's really darn good. Think seasonal and organic produce. If you know cooking from scratch is best, but sometimes you need a little help, Green Chef's got you. 
Go to greenchef.com slash sustainable60 and use code sustainable60 to get 60% off plus free shipping. That's greenchef.com slash sustainable60. Are you going on vacation this summer and don't want to lug around a bunch of baby gear? I hear you. BabyQuip is the number one baby equipment rental service and marketplace that provides families with clean and safe and insured baby equipment. Everything you need to have a great time on vacation without the hassle of lugging all these big baby items around. Renting baby gear allows you to enjoy the adventure of a vacation. So whether you're flying or driving, renting baby gear will eliminate the need to pack and haul all that big stuff. Welcome to the world of stress-free family travel, my friends. Right now, my listeners can get $20 off your reservation of $100 or more with code SUSTAINABLE at babyquip.com, B-A-B-Y-Q-U-I-P dot com, and use promo code SUSTAINABLE to get $20 off today. Enjoy the journey with BabyQuip. And we're back today as part of Climate Optimism Week. We're discussing new technologies and especially carbon capture. Before the break, we talked about trees and small-scale solutions. And now we're on to the big-scale solutions. We're on to post-combustion capture. I cannot say that phrase for the life of me. It's a big, fat tongue twister. (laughs) Well, post-combustion capture captures emissions from smokestacks at coal or natural gas power plants or factories. It is currently the main carbon capture method being pursued in the United States. Now, the takeaway point that I want you to understand here is that the carbon is being captured as it is being emitted from the factory, right? So once the gas, it's called flue gas, is captured. The CO2 is separated from all the other compounds in the gas. This is done in a variety of ways, and we're not going to get into the nuts and bolts of all the ways today, but the most common and advanced way is by using chemicals to scrub the CO2 out of the flue gas. And then the chemicals bind to CO2 at lower temperatures, and then will release the CO2 again when the temperature is heated. This will yield close to pure carbon dioxide. So once it's captured, once it's isolated, the carbon dioxide is pressurized into a liquid state, again, just like in the example before the break with the apartment complex, and then it's transported by a pipeline, keyword pipeline, to a place where it can either be used or stored. And we're going to talk about either using or storing carbon in a minute. But I want to say here that here in the United States, in the Midwest, at the moment, post-combustion capture is what we are heavily investing in. At the moment, again, in the Midwest, there is a pipeline proposal to capture emissions from ethanol plants. Ethanol plants, by the way, turn corn into fuel and CO2 is a byproduct of that process. And so one such proposed pipeline, it is 2,000 miles long. So we have to build this thing. And it would carry carbon dioxide across five states to underground storage in North Dakota. If it's built, it would be the largest such pipeline in the entire world. Now, there's a similar project that's being proposed by a different company, and it would keep some of its carbon above ground for commercial use, and the rest would be stored below ground. We're going to be talking about use and sequestration, which is storing again in a minute. But of course, keyword here is pipelines. There are risks with pipelines. Think about all the pipeline disasters you've heard about in your life, right? As with any pipeline, a CO2 pipeline can indeed rupture. One actually did rupture in Mississippi in 2020. So if we're spending all this money building all these pipelines to keep carbon out of the atmosphere and then, whoops, our 2,000-mile pipeline just ruptured and all that carbon went into the atmosphere anyway, it's good to ask ourselves whether that's a good use of money, time, manpower, brain power, et cetera. Also, one more quick little point here before we move on is that at the moment, there is currently in the United States no federal oversight body for carbon dioxide pipeline projects. Another 
thing to consider. The final way that we can capture carbon in 2023 is through direct air capture. There are currently 19 direct air capture facilities in operation around the world, and of these, 18 are in Canada, Europe, and the United States. Now, when I think about direct air capture, what comes to my mind, and it's not like this at all, but this is what I picture. Somebody with a gigantic net just sticking it out into the atmosphere and collecting a lot of air and then separating the carbon out from the oxygen and all the other things, taking the carbon out somehow, and then doing something with the carbon. Again, there's no net, but the process is similar and that we're not collecting the carbon from smokestacks as we did in post-combustion capture. We're capturing the carbon from the air. Now, you may have heard of the gigantic direct air capture plant that's located in Iceland. It's called Orca. Again, you've probably heard about it. It is currently capturing 4,000 tons of carbon dioxide a year, and then it stores it in rock. Again, we'll talk about storage in a hot minute. But critics of direct air capture say that carbon capture is way more efficient when it's used on sources with high concentrations of carbon dioxide, again, like post-combustion capture, which we just discussed. And the reason why is that when you capture it directly from smokestacks or in the case of the ethanol plants, directly from the ethanol plants, that's smart because burning ethanol releases a gas that's very close to 100% carbon dioxide. Cement production, so a cement factory, let's say, releases a gas that's about 15% carbon dioxide. And so when we talk about direct air capture in which we have a net and we're just grabbing as much air as we can and then filtering out the carbon, well, the atmosphere, by contrast, is about 0.04% carbon dioxide. So over 1,000 tons of ordinary air would have to be processed in order to capture a single ton of CO2. And that's why critics say that as of this moment, carbon capture is more efficient when, again, it's post-combustion capture as opposed to direct air capture. Okay, so now we're moving on to what do you do with the carbon that you've captured, right? If we were using trees, the trees would store the carbon for us without us ever having to think or worry about it. The apartment building we talked about in Manhattan, they are using the carbon to create cement blocks. The breweries we discussed are using the carbon to make foam. And so when it comes to answering the question of, well, what do you do with the carbon that you collect? There are really at the moment only two options. The first is putting the carbon to use somehow. And the second is storing it also called sequestration. And we're going to talk about both of those things. So let's talk about putting the carbon to use first. There are indeed commercial uses for carbon dioxide, but many of them result in the gas eventually being released back into the atmosphere at some later point. So the best way and the easiest and simplest way I can describe this is to think about a can of soda. Okay, so by using it to create the carbonation in our beverage. So you have a can of your favorite soda, your favorite carbonated beverage, let's say. When you crack open the can, the carbon then escapes into the atmosphere. Think about that can of soda on a large scale. Same with creating dry ice. So you use carbon to create dry ice, sounds great, but once that dry ice melts, the carbon is still going back into the atmosphere. Now, carbon dioxide is of use, especially in the energy industry. And as I talk about this, I really would love it if you thought about how ironic <laughs> this strategy is. Okay, you ready? So when we're using carbon in the energy industry, this is how it works. They take carbon dioxide, they inject it into old oil wells. And when they inject it into old oil wells, it forces more crude oil out of the ground. So there's not much room underground. You're 
injecting a bunch of carbon into the well. It's going to push the crude oil over to the pipe that's going to then suck it out of the ground. Now, of course, if you're like many environmentalists, you're probably skeptical of any process that uses captured carbon to obtain more fossil fuels that will in turn just release more carbon into the atmosphere. The irony is just like I'm trying not to laugh as as I'm saying this out loud. It makes no sense. But that's one way in which we could potentially put carbon dioxide to use. Now, if you don't want to put carbon to use, you could store it, store it underground. This is also called carbon sequestration. And when you store it underground, you have to do so in a way that it's not going to, of course, escape back into the atmosphere. And so as of this moment in time, sequestration is done by injecting it deep, deep underground. It has to be injected at least 2,600 feet underground. It has to be under an impermeable layer of rock. And of course, only certain rock formations are suitable for storing carbon. The rock must be, again, really far underground. It must be deep enough to stay away from groundwater. The rock must be porous and permeable. Think like a sandstone or a limestone. And it needs to be permeable and porous so that there's space within it for when the injected gas goes in, there's room for the injected gas. And finally, the formation of rock must have a layer of dense, non-porous rock like shale on top of it so that the carbon dioxide will not be able to seep out of the porous rock and out into the surface. Phew. A lot of information there, but the final word for you today, as per my opinion, is that carbon capture is great and all. I definitely think it's part of the climate solution, but it is not the only climate solution, and we need to be doing multiple things simultaneously. Carbon capture is just one of the things we need to be doing. If we put all our eggs in the carbon capture innovation bucket and use putting all our eggs in that bucket as a means to ignore reducing emissions in the first place, we're missing the point, and I dare say we're doomed to fail. I'm thinking about my conversation on Tuesday with Anne Therese Janeri, and she was saying we need to take the urgency out of climate change. If you listened, you know what I'm talking about. But the point that was made there, the point that she made there, was essentially that we need to tone down our need to solve, solve, solve without first thinking. We need to slow down and make sure that where we're putting the money, where we're putting the brain power and the manpower, and where we're putting all our eggs, let's say, is in the right spot because we simply don't have time We don't have decades to put into carbon capture if carbon capture is going to turn out to not be a large-scale solution. This is indeed Climate Optimism Week on this podcast, so I am flipping the script. Let's stay optimistic and remember that innovation and new technologies can definitely be part of the climate solution. It just can't be the only solution. We will be back tomorrow on Headlines. I'm going to try my darndest to keep it positive because again, it's Climate Optimism Week. Woo-hoo. As always, reach out if you need me. I should say here too, this is an aside and I'm putting it at the end of the episode (laughs) because it's not related to anything. But Climate Optimism Week was inspired by my lovely husband who I did, in fact, interview a few weeks back. He said to me, Stephanie, you need to stop talking about intentional living. You need to stop talking about the brain so much and you need to go back to talking about climate change and climate solutions. So thank you to my lovely husband, Hug, for being the inspiration behind Climate Optimism Week. My dear husband, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you all enjoyed it as well. I'll see you tomorrow for headlines. Reach out as always if you need me. I love hearing from you. It's like the best part of my day. So if you've been on the fence thinking you were going to say hi, thinking you were going to tell me something, but you were kind of on the fence, I love hearing from all of you. So just do it. Just say hello. I'll see you tomorrow and take care.